Well, I won't say anything else since I get in trouble. I just, I'm an old speech and debate person, all right? That's what I did in high school. So anybody who can speak well in public office impresses me. I always enjoy that. Okay, so uh, today we're going to continue talking about the gamma function, which we started yesterday. And we'll see how, uh, how much we can do with that. And if we have time at the end, I want to talk just very briefly about uh, using computing Laplace transforms of series. Okay, so remember series when we add up an infinite number of things. Uh, and specifically, I want to look at if you have some function and you want to know it's a plus transform, one potential way to do that is to find its Taylor series or McLaurin series and then compute the Laplace transform term by term and see if that you know, can give you any new information. And uh, if we get far enough in here, then we'll at least introduce called the Bessel function. Well, at first we're just going to see the Bessel function of order zero, but uh, I'll tell you more in the weeks to come. So, uh, well, let's see. Let's let's remember, uh, let's recall what, what prompted the discussion of the gamma function. So first, well, it seems for a while we're just going to start by writing our table on the board so we get used to things like so uh, if you have a function, you get its Laplace transform. We know, for instance, 1 has Laplace transform, what was that? Yes. 1 over s. OK. Uh, t to the n, where n is just a natural number, we know was n factorial over s to the n plus 1. OK. And I'm going to leave some room here today. Uh, but after that, it was really you know, useful knowing, for instance, e to the at was just this shift. Right? It just took, actually shifted the Laplace transform for 1 over by this a. And generally, if you multiply a function f of t by e to the at, if you can figure out the Laplace transform of f, then you can configure, you can figure out the Laplace transform when multiplied by e to the at just by taking the Laplace transform and shifting it by a. Of course, it's important at all these levels to say, remember, OK, s greater than 0, here s greater than a, here s greater than a. OK, and then we also had uh, sine of at and cosine of at. This was, uh, well, let's see, they're both over s squared plus a squared. And then we remember, OK, one of them's got an a on top, one's got an s. The sign should have the s, but it doesn't. So the s is better than the cosine. Okay. Okay. So then yesterday we said that there was a problem with our table, and that this right was only good when n is a natural number, okay, or possibly zero. Uh, but what we wanted was well, we'd like to be able to do this for any exponent. And we were able, at least if p is any exponent greater than 1, no, greater than negative 1, we were able to write down a formula for this. So we computed it, well, it's some function, which we call the gamma function. And I'll write down that definition again, divided by, well, s plus 1. So what we got? Oh, okay. we, uh, and that's for any p. So it's for any p greater than uh, minus 1. Okay, so. Good. So this was the, the interesting part from yesterday. Okay, so how do we define this gamma function? So gamma of p plus 1, when p is greater than minus 1, is equal to an improper integral. Right? And you 
remember, we got this improper integral quite naturally. Right? The way we got it was by trying to compute the Laplace transform of t to the p directly. And when we wrote down that definition, we did a little substitution to replace the st with an x. And when we did that, we ended up with something that looked like this. So after we took the definition of the Laplace transform, where our f of t was t to the p, and we replaced st by x, this is the integral we got. And we showed that this converges. Well, we showed it converges for p equals 1 half. Yeah, that was the only case we actually did. Uh, but I assigned you the homework problem to uh, prove that it works for p greater than minus 1. And as I was telling Christina before uh, most of you showed up, that uh, the proof that we did for 1 half should work for, for all these p's. The, of course, the, the key thing is you figure out why does that proof not work when p is, say, negative 1 or something even less. Right? So that's, that's the interesting part of that problem. But the, the proof should, uh, should carry through quite nicely. Okay, and then there was this weird, uh, this weird issue that there's a shift here between p and p plus 1. Right? This is historical. We won't go into why it is, but that's just how you define this gamma function. Uh, and I also mentioned you can extend this definition of the gamma function uh, using what's called analytic continuation, right? and that's going to go into the, the complex plane. Uh, and maybe well, when we talk about uh, complex variables uh, in a couple of weeks, we can talk more about that. But for now, uh, we'll just leave it like this. Okay. So uh, the O, and the, of course, the interesting uh, property of the gamma function that we noticed was well, this formula is working for all p greater than minus 1, including integers, right? uh, or natural numbers. And so, in particular, right, we know that if you take the Laplace transform, let me put that in the middle, if you take the Laplace transform of t to the n, right, here now n is a natural number, on the one hand, we know that this is going to be n factorial over s to the n plus 1. And on the other hand, we know that this is going to be gamma of n plus 1 over s to the n plus 1. And so we conclude that gamma of n plus 1 equals n factorial. So this is a pretty cool formula because it tells us that the factorial function, which is a purely discrete function, can be continuized. Right? We can make it continuous okay, by viewing it as just a special case of this gamma function, right, which is a really strange function. I mean, the values of this thing are usually transcendental. Right? What are the odds that just don't happen to be on natural numbers that actually spit out natural numbers? Factorial. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we did I miss anything? No. Okay. So today, uh, what I want to do is compute a few other values of the gamma function that are interesting. So let's see how far I'll work. Okay, I shouldn't go too much further than this. Okay, so these aren't really theorems. They're not really strong enough to be theorems. So I'll call them proposition. So uh, before I can uh, before I can give you some good values for the gamma function, I need the following uh, integral. So maybe you've seen this before. P is u. All right, so what is this? Where is this coming from? You've seen this before. The series. From what? From the series. From? Well, you've seen this in a class, I'm sure, before. This, this function, this integral to this function, right? Maybe you tweak it with a, mm -hmm. you know, coefficient up here, but more or less you've seen this, right? You and if you haven't, uh, the rest of you who are taking two fifty five, you will. Theory of kind of series one minus 
one minus sex plus something. I'm not sure what you're getting at. The way I I figure you see it is in your probability course. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. What's that? It's using thermodynamics. It's using it's using yeah. thermodynamics as well. <laughs> oh, okay. So, okay. So you, you have to explain the, the physics stuff because that's fine. I, that's wonderful if you can explain it because I I'm not qualified to do so. Uh, I know, for instance, that if you're talking about right normal distributions, right? You want to you want to write down actually the bell curve, right? You're talking about this stuff right here. Okay. This is giving you the area under one half of well something very close to the bell curve. Find set of the constant, right? So, okay. so we want to actually evaluate this, figure out what the area is, and uh, well, why am I going to have problems evaluating this integral? Just squared. Yeah, it's it's u squared, right? The minus, okay, the u minus you don't worry so much about, right? But that u squared. If I try to find an antiderivative for this, I toast. Right? There is no elementary antiderivative for this function. Okay, what do I mean by elementary? I mean take all the functions that you know. None of them, you can't, you can't combine any of them and get the antiderivative for this. Right? Now one way you can do it is do a series expansion, right? You can take the, the Maclaurin series for, for e to the x, plug in minus u squared, and you can integrate it term by term. But still, that, that answer, you're not going to get an elementary function. Whatever answer you get is not element. Okay, nonetheless, we can compute it. And the cool thing is that somehow pi gets into the game. And it just ends up being root pi over 2. Okay, so uh, this actually, if you're in the right frame of mind, for instance, if you're teaching multivariable calculus, uh, this here gives away the whole story. This is going to give it away. The reason why this is going to give it away is because I ah, pi. Now pi has got to be coming from, from circles. That's where pi comes from, right? Circles, circles. Now when I'm integrating, how do I get circle? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Where is that situation where you end up with circles instead of rectangular things? Ah, when you go into polar coordinates, right? That's where those circles come from, the polar coordinates. So that tells you somehow you really like getting polar coordinates. Okay, uh, so uh, the way we're going to do it is a little bit slick. We're going to write down two copies of this. So let me, uh, let's see, what's my notation? I think it's called IBU. Yeah. So first, okay, I, I don't want to deal with this infinity, because that's kind of a pain. So let me define, well, I should write group down first. I'm going to define i sub b to be the integral from 0 to b, e to the, let's call it minus x squared, dx. I just change the, the symbols on you, it doesn't matter. Uh, but why am I changing the symbols? Well, because I actually want to write it down twice. And I think you'll after getting over the confusion of me writing down the same thing with two different variables, to say, okay, well, it's definitely the same thing. I've just changed the letters. Okay? So, if I consider I, B, I sub B squared, well, I can just multiply one of these by itself, or I can multiply these two together. This thing in, well, those of you who were with me in 265, you had this product rule for integration. Yeah. Not like the product rule for differentiation. This one was much easier. The product rule for integration said that if you were integrating with respect to different variables, right, and there's no, uh, you know, there's no overlap there. These are just x's, these are just y's. You can put them all together in one integral just by multiplying the integrands. 
right? And then do dx dy. So this is equal to the integral from 0 to b, integral from 0 to b, right? Make it into a, an iterated integral. E to the minus x squared times e to the minus y squared, which is e to the minus, uh, say, x squared plus y squared. And then you can do <coughs> dx dy. Okay, good. And of course, once you put it into this iterated integral form, you know you can convert it into a double integral. Now this is a double integral over a region, right? It's a rectangle. It's just a R. Just this nice rectangle with side length B, but it's a square. Okay. Uh, and then you can have e to the minus x squared plus y squared. And I'll write dA. Okay. I'll stop at that level here. Okie dokie day. So, uh, so here's where the the, the, the trick. Let me draw a picture. This way. I need to write this down. Okay. So let me see. I'll draw my rectangle in my square. draw two circles, uh, or at least arcs from two circles. One of them is going to be the circle right, who's centered at zero, and the arc would hit the y-axis here and head down to, to be there. Draw this little arc in. And then the other one, well, I actually need probably a lot more room, okay, is going to be the circle again centered at zero, but which would hit this square at this point. So let's see here. What did I use in my notation? Oh, I, I, for, I maybe I changed just my notation slightly. Since everything is dependent on the b, let me call this r sub b. So it's consistent with what I wrote. Fine. Uh, so what can we say? Uh, well, first, if I integrate over this square, then what I'm going to get is more than if I just integrated over this arc, right, or this, this sector. Right? But it's less than if I'd integrated over the big sector. So let me give, do I need names? Probably good names. I'll call this sector R1. And then if you do everything, we'll call it R2. Okay, and I won't color anything in, because maybe I'll confuse the issue more. So the little sectors are one, the big sectors are two. And we know, well, probably, I didn't write this in my paper, but we probably need a B here. Really? Okay. I don't like my notation here. Can we change the notation? Will that bother anybody? I just, I, just, I want everything to, to be clearly dependent on B. So let me try some new notation. OK, uh, since this is part of a circle, I'm going to call it uh, C for circle. And it's going to have a radius of B, right? That's the radius of the circle is B. OK, but a CB in complex analysis, that meant the whole circle, radius B. Uh, so, since I just want the sort of the positive positive quadrant, let me call it CB plus <laughs> plus. Okay, so that means the positive quadrant is part of it. And then this whole thing, okay, ah, so we need to know the radius of this. What's this radius here? Well, that's B and that's B, so this radius must be B square root of 2. As a b squared plus b squared equals 2b squared, so the square root is all right, b squared 2. So 
Uh, so this will be C sub V root 2, and again, it's plus plus. Because <laughs> it's in the plus plus plus. That, that notation makes me feel better. That notation really chaps my heart. <coughs> All right, so what we can get, though, immediately is that if you take the double integral over CB plus plus, this is, I need the function, e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA. This will be less than or equal to the integral over RB, which is not a fast food restaurant, but this square. And then, of course, this is less than or equal to, apologize for going so far over, the double integral over C B root 2 plus plus e to the minus x squared plus y squared. And so we can bound the integral that we're looking for by these two integrals. Okay, so why is that so useful? Well, Integrating over a square, right, with this function is not going to be nearly as convenient as integrating over part of the circle. Why? Because with circles, as your regions, it's really easy to change them into what? Polar. Polar coordinates, right? That's the whole goal, right? That's why I said from the beginning, right? We want to go over and put everything in polar coordinates. So, uh, okay. So what's What's the deal with polar coordinates, right? Well, you remember with polar coordinates, uh, the x squared plus y squared is r squared. And, uh, uh, what do you have? You have r, I'm sorry, uh, x equals a cosine of theta, right? y equals a sine of theta. I'm sorry, I wrote a, but I mean r, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so those are your, sort of your rules for doing that. So let's see here. So this first one, well it's a circle. So let's see what's happening to the, the radius. Well it's going from 0 to B. Right? Because it's a circle radius B. And what's happening to the angle? Well the angle is going from 0 to pi over 2. So I can write this as the integral from 0 to pi over 2, then the integral from 0 to B. And then I can do e to the minus r squared. But when you change the polar coordinates, there's always a cost. What's the cost of changing the polar coordinates? The Jacobian. All right. What's the Jacobian of the transformation for polar coordinates? R sine theta. Much easier. It's just an. It's just an R. Right? That's the, the, the cost. So the Jacobian of the transformation is R, which is wonderful. Right? Why is that wonderful? Well, look at that. That e, I mean, we ended up with, if we had no R, right, you'd be in exactly the same problems we started with. But this R here makes all the difference. Now you can do substitution and the whole thing's going to unravel. Okay, so this will be less than or equal to, well, let's just our R. All right, that's just our IB squared. I don't need to write that again. Okay, that's what we were looking for. And then this will be less than or equal to, on the other side, well, again, the angle is just going from 0 to pi over 2. The radius is going from 0 to B root 2. And then, of course, the innards are the same. Right? You get the same integrand. So we're just reduced to solving these and, and, and hoping that uh, you know we, we get a nice bound on it. So, so what do we got here? Uh, well, let's see. Of course, the substitution will be u equals minus r squared. Right? And so then that'll give you that uh, du is two minus two r dr. So, uh, well. You need to get a minus one half right, to, to, to make everything balance. So let's see here. So you have zero to pi over two. You're going to need to get a minus one half. We'll pull that all the way out to the front. Okay, and then it would just become e to the u. 
uh, the integral of e to the u is, of course, e to the u. Uh, so then you can put the minus r squared back in, and you get e to the minus r squared evaluated at 0 and b. Okay, and then everything else. Okay, this is going to do exactly the same business. Uh, we'll get e to the minus r squared, but this time evaluated b root 2 and 0. Okay, I trust that you can fill in these details with integration. Um, and then let's see here. So what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get an e to the minus r squared evaluated at b, which is going to be e to the minus b squared. I'll pull that out because it's actually going to be a constant. There's no thetas in there. Right? And then when I evaluate at 0, I'm going to get a 1. And then I'm just going to be left with 0 to pi over 2 d theta. So that's just going to be the length of the interval, It'll just be pi over 2. So let's see, what do we get? We have we had a minus 1 half. I told you we're going to get a pi over 2. And then we're going to get an e to the minus b squared minus 1. The minus 1 comes from plugging in 0. Okay. And we'll get the exact same thing over here, only replacing the b's with b root 2's. So, we'll, oh, I should have had a minus 1 half out here. Okay, so we'll have a minus 1 half, we'll have a pi over 2, and we'll have an e to the minus, okay, now we got a square of b root 2, so it'll be 2b squared. Minus 1. Okay, so... To simplify things just slightly, uh, minus pi over 4. Let's see, I'll just move this minus in to the inside. You get 1 minus e to the minus b squared over uh, oh, times pi. Times pi over 4 is less than or equal to i b squared. Is less than or equal to, the uh, same thing, pi uh, 1 minus e to the minus 2b squared over uh, 4. Okay, so we now have an estimation of i sub b squared. And what do we want to do? Well, we'll go back to the beginning. Remember, we're trying to compute this integral, right, which goes from 0 to infinity. And we've done it for b. So we need to take the limit as b goes to infinity. squared goes to infinity, so you get e to the minus something going to infinity, so that just goes to zero, so it's just pi over four. But if we do it to the other side, well, there's really not much else happening over there, is it? Yeah, there's, there's a two up here, but that really doesn't change much. He's going to infinity, so again, this goes to pi over four. So, it's bounded between two functions, which are both becoming pi over 4. So, by the which theorem? Squeeze. The squeeze theorem, right? Anybody who's in my 165 certainly remembers people getting squeezed, don't they? So, by the squeeze theorem, okay, we know that the limit as v goes to infinity of i v squared is pi over 4. Which means that the limit as b goes to infinity of i sub b, which is what we want, right? That's actually our that's our integral. That's what we want. Why well, you just have to take the square root? So that's the square root of pi over two. Phew. Okay, so this is a nice little trick. Uh, so the, the, the first part of the trick that's nice is figuring out that it, to actually compute this, it's much better 
to make this into a function of two variables is a problem, right? And then once you've put it into this, this language, it's even better to notice, ah, computing it over this square, a rectangle is, is not the preferred way to do this, right? We need to bound it by some circles so we can go into polar coordinates, make that bar a curve. That's the key. Okay. Any questions? So it's a nice little derivation. It's very classical derivation. Get a nice corollary of this proposition. So we can now compute, for instance, gamma of one half. So we can answer the question: uh, you know, What's negative one half factorial? <laughs> what should that mean? And it's going to be the square root of pi. It's really cool to see these things show up in weird places. The, the proof is now going to be uh, almost immediate. So gamma, well, you, you, the, the hard part of this, you've got to remember the definition of gamma. Okay. So gamma of 1 half equals, okay, so gamma is an improper integral that goes from 0 to infinity. And then there's an x term and an exponential term. Right? So there's this polynomial x term. And you have to raise it to the pth power. And remember, there's this shift by 1, right? So if that's a 1 half, then this is actually a minus, a minus 1 half. Right? Shift down by 1. And then you put in your e to the minus x. Dx. Okay. So I uh, I said that this is almost immediate, and well, why is it almost immediate? Well, we need to make a substitution. Right? That's why it's not immediate. It's almost immediate. Okay. So what's the substitution that I want to make? Well, what I would like to do is use the previous proposition, because this is a corollary. Right? Corollary means it's coming from something that you had before. So, okay, I, I want to get it into this form. So how am I going to do that? Well, I better somehow get a uh, square up there. Yeah, so I'm going to do substitution. What's my substitution going to be? Well, I want that to be a u squared, so, so how about... x equals u squared. Yeah, how about x equals u squared? So if I do that, then dx will equal 2u du. And what about uh, x to the minus 1 half? Well, that'll be u squared to the minus 1 half, which will just be yeah, u to the minus 1 or 1 over u. So there's our substitution. And the great thing now is that, uh, well, look. Uh, well, first, OK, as when x is 0, so is u. When x goes to infinity, so does, so does u. So will u. So we don't need to worry about changing the, the limits. So we get to 0 to infinity. And you leave a little space here. Because what's going to happen? x to the minus half becomes 1 over u. But dx becomes 2u du. So those u's will cancel. There's this extra 2. You got to pull that out. Price of doing business. Okay, so the x to the minus one half that went away. The e to the minus x becomes e to the minus u squared, and we already took care of the two u in front of du, so you just get a du. And with that nice substitution, we can now apply proposition 4.5, and we know that this is going to be two times the square root of pi over two, which is the square root. Yeah, that's quite nice, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, let's see. Well, what if, let's see, let's try this. We had actually wanted to know originally what to do with um, not a negative one half power here, but actually a one half, right? We wanted to know the Laplace transform of the square root of t. And we figured out, okay, this corresponds to the gamma function of three halves. So let's uh, try it. Must be another corollary. So what will this be? Well, this actually is just going to end up being this integral. Why? Well, it, it's going to be the exact same proof, right? Only uh, it'll be slightly easier. So let's see. Uh, gamma of 3 halves equals the integral from 0 to infinity x to the 1 half, right? You subtract 1 from this. e to the minus x dx. We use the exact same substitution. So x equals u squared dx equals 2u du, and now x to the 1 half is just going to be u squared to the 1 half, which is u. Actually, this will be even a little easier. I don't even know you can to use this. But it just occurred to me there's another way to do this. And we'll, we'll We'll handle that in just a second. But we'll do it this way. Uh, okay, so what does that give us? Uh, we get, let's see, x to the 1 half becomes a u, and we get e to the minus u squared, and oh dear, this is not good, is it? No, no, no this is very bad. Yeah, that's what you would get, and we, we don't know, actually, really know what to do with this. Oh, okay, so this is bad. So let's not use substitution. Let's try the other way I was just thinking of. Let's try it this way. Uh, what, what can we... Uh, what can we, we... Well, we need a property of the gamma function. Yeah. And the property of the gamma function I want to use this. If you evaluate the gamma function at p plus 1, this, I want to write this in terms of the gamma function of p. Okay, so let's use our intuition based on the factorial function to figure out what it should be. You have n plus 1 factorial. How can you write it as something times n factorial? n plus 1. Yeah, yeah, multiply by n plus 1. So we know that the gamma function, at least for the natural numbers, looks like factorial. So there is a, uh, there's a good chance some formula like this could hold. Right? But you have to be careful here, because we know there's this shift. You might think, ah, okay, so I should just put a p plus 1 out here. But it's not quite right. Okay. It's shifted down by 1. You can put a p. Okay. So uh, let's, let's get back to this in a second. Okay, let's just take this as a given for right now. And we'll see if we can prove that. I don't know, I can't remember if I stated that already. But in any case, okay, there it is. So if we use this, then this is gamma of 3 halves is a half gamma of one half, which we just computed. Okay. Gamma of one half is root pi. So this is root pi over two. Okay, so that's a much shorter way to prove it than even substitution. Which didn't work as we did it. Maybe there's a better substitution. Okay, so maybe we try to, to justify this.
Okay, so how about uh, I'll have to add this. Lemma, 4.8. Gamma of P plus 1 equals P. Gamma of P. Oh dear, how are we going to prove this? Well, we probably need to go to the definition of gamma and see what we can do. So let's see. Uh, gamma of p plus 1 equals the integral from 0 to infinity x to the p e to the minus x dx. So, if p was a natural number, what would you use to evaluate an antiderivative? If it was x cubed, e to the minus x. x cubed plus one divided by t plus partial fractions. Not partial fractions, oh, but no, no, well, you're thinking of no, the, the other one that has par in it, or part in it. <laughs> integration by parts, right? Okay. Well, integration by parts is not going to solve the problem, all right, in the sense of finding an antiderivative that doesn't have more integrals to evaluate, but we can reduce it a step. So I put my x to the p here and my e to the minus x. Okay. I can differentiate and get px to the p minus 1, and oh my, look at that, you get a p coming out, right? That's what we kind of need. And then over here you get minus e to the minus x plus minus. Okay, so what happens? This is equal to Okay, you need to take, uh, well, I'll just write it in shorthand, minus x to the p, e to the minus x, evaluated from 0 to infinity. Of course, really, you should have a limit. And then minus minus is plus p, I can pull that out, integral 0 to infinity, x to the p minus 1, e to the minus x, dx. Okay, so this is just integration by parts. And what happens here is, x goes to infinity, well, this goes to zero, and this is not going to infinity fast enough, right? This is a polynomial, and it gets beat by the exponential, so this dies as you go to infinity. So that's zero, and then as you go to zero, well, x, x, this goes to zero. It kills, it doesn't matter what e to the minus x is doing, even though we know it's going to one, okay? So, so this, this whole term dies. So you're just left with p integral 0 to infinity, x to the p minus 1, e to the minus 1 dx. This is p times, oh, that's just the definition of gamma of p. Okay, no problem. Okay, so it's a very easy formula. Should have given it to his homework. Okay. Uh, So this is a, probably enough about the gamma function for now. So we, we now know the definition. We now know, for instance, that uh, the Laplace transform of the square root of t is root pi over 2 s to the 3 halves. Yeah. In case you were wondering, we now have that. Uh, we also see how if you ended up with a Laplace transform that ended up with a fractional exponent, we have a much better chance of figuring out where that's coming from, right? what function that's coming from. All right. Any questions before we hastily move on?
Taylor series of a function f of x at x equals 0, which is also uh, called the Maclaurin series when it's x equals 0, is given by f of x equals, it's going to be a sum, i equals 0 to infinity. Actually, let me use j for those of you in 481. Uh, this will be uh, the j derivative of f evaluated at 0, that 0 coming from that 0, divided by j factorial times x to the j. example, we know that uh, e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so forth. We know that sine of x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth plus 5 factorial minus plus Cosine of x is 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. So you've had some practice with this, I believe. So I'm going to first uh, do things with these specific. Taylor series because they're quite easy. But then next week we'll come back and do it with one which is a little more complicated. But what is a very nice fact, let me just remark it, I won't go into the proof here, is that um, the Laplace transform of a series. Just remember, each one of these is a series because it's an infinite sum. The Laplace transform of the series is the series of the Laplace transforms. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean you can take the Laplace transform term by term to get the Laplace transform of the whole series. So additivity, which is what we had for Laplace transforms, works even for an infinite sum. So the Laplace transform of f of x is the sum i j equals 0 to infinity uh, f j Zero. Remember, this is not the j power, this is the j derivative, divided by j factorial times the Laplace transform of x to the j. Okay, where you see I'm allowed to pull out these coefficients because they're just constants. Okay, so Let's, uh, let's test that remark. So let's see, what is the Laplace transform of e to the x? Well, we know what the answer is going to be. It's got to be 1 over s minus 1. Or I could use t's here, right? I guess I should be using t's everywhere. Use t's. Or it's just a letter. Always go over to the, the power series expansion, the Taylor series. So let's see. We're going to do it term by term. What's the Laplace transform of 1? Over s. Okay, so 1 over s. Plus, okay, the Laplace transform of t. 1 over s squared. 1 over s squared, fine. Laplace transform of uh, t squared over 2 factorial. 
mean, when's the first time you've used that? S cubed. One over S cubed. Right. Well, it should be, there was no, uh, there was just X squared or T squared. You'd say, oh, it's uh, 2 factorial over S cubed. But look at that. The 2 factorial cancels. That's nice. So just 1 over S cubed. And at this point, you start to see a pattern. You know, I better check one more term to make sure it works. You say, oh, OK, what's this one going to be? Ah, well, I'm going to get a 3 factorial, which will cancel over S to the fourth. Okay. It's going to keep going this way. Right? If you're in the nth term, right, the Laplace transform of t to the n will be n factorial, which will cancel the n factorial on the bottom over S to the n plus 1. Okay. Exactly works. Uh, this doesn't look immediately like 1 over s minus 1. Uh, how can we solve that? Well, let's see. First, I factor. I pull 1 over s out. Now, what do we got? This is a very special one. It's a geometric series. What's the ratio? One minus s. So the ratio, right, between terms is one over s. So we know since this is a geometric series, okay, one over s. I just copy. The sum of a geometric series, right, with ratio r is one over one minus r. So this is one over one minus r. R here we said was one over s. So one over s. If I multiply these together, well, I get s times 1 is s, minus s times 1 over s is 1. Oh. Oh. Now, there's some restriction. Of course, when you sum a geometric series, you're not allowed the ratio to have absolute value greater than 1, or even equal to 1. So we need to make sure that 1 over s is less than 1, it's the same as saying that s is greater than 1, which is perfect, right? That's exactly what we said before when we computed the Laplace transform of e to the t, right? If it was e to the at, s should be greater than a. So in this case, s is greater than 1. Okay, so it works just, just right. Let's try it for sign. So we know the answer, of course. It's going to be uh, well something over s squared plus 1. It's either a or s. a is 1. Uh, so it's either 1 or s. But since we it's sine, we want it to be s, but it's not. So it's going to be 1. So 1 over s squared plus 1 should be the answer. Let's check it. So first term you get, OK, you take the Laplace term, transform of t. That's 1 over s squared. And you're going to get a minus. Okay, well, we actually know what happens. When you take the Laplace transform of any of these terms, you just get, right, the, the factorials cancel each time. We saw that up here. So the factorials cancel, and you just get 1 over, I'll we'll just raise the exponent by 1, right? 1 over s to the 4. And then the next one will be uh, 1 over s to the 6, and so on. Again, I'll factor out something. This time I can factor out a 1 over s squared. That makes the first term a 1, and then minus 1 over s squared, plus 1 over s to the fourth, minus, plus, and so on. And remember, it was like the very first day uh, of Laplace transforms, and I, I wrote down the geometric series. And I said, this has got to be the most important series that you know, right? You've got to use it again here. What's, what's the ratio? Minus 1 over s squared, right? Switches each time. That's why you get that minus. So this is 1 over s squared times 1 over 1 minus minus 1 over s squared. So plus 1 over s squared. Multiplying this together, 1 over s squared plus 1. Just as we had hoped. And Well, again, uh, we need to make sure that uh, 
know, 1 over s squared isn't bigger than 1. Right? It has to be less than 1. So 1 over s squared is less than 1. That means that uh, s squared is greater than 1. So s should be greater than 1. We want to do it this way, that's where we got to go. About the cosine, now it should be getting very easy. Right. Cosine, uh, well, you just have the, the missing terms here, right? The first one you get is 1 over s minus 1 over s cubed plus 1 over s to the fifth minus plus. Factor out of 1 over s. 1 minus 1 over s squared plus 1 over s to the fourth minus plus. Okay, it's the same thing, right? It's a geometric series. The ratio is minus 1 over s squared. So this is 1 over s times. Actually, take that bottom s now and pull it up to the top. That's s over s squared plus one. Oh, okay. And again, we're say s is greater than one. Okay. So this is uh, this is useful. Uh, so cosines minus squares and plus. Yeah. Did I? Oh. Of course, it should be minus plus minus. Yeah, it doesn't change between the two. Uh, yeah, and that's right there. So. Yeah, they should always start with a minus, sines and cosines. I mean, well, after the first term, it should be minus. Okay. Uh, so, the, uh, the next thing I want to do from here is do one that we don't already know the answer to. Right? And this is going to be uh, the Bessel function. So I'll, let me just brief you on the, the background a little bit because we don't have enough time to go through it today. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a history. So Bessel was interested in studying a phenomenon called planetary perturbations. I imagine has to do with the perturbations of planets. Okay, so uh, in the process of studying this phenomena, Bessel came up with what's known as Bessel's equation now. And it's actually a family of differential equations. If I could put an equation, it's usually just written like Bessel's equation. And uh, it's going to say the following t squared times the second partial of y. Uh, let's see, is it minus or plus? It's plus. But probably backwards. Uh, step myself. Yeah, yeah, everything's plus. Okay. Plus t times y prime plus, alright, and this is where the the, the parameter comes in. You write t squared minus c squared times y. So uh, this c can change, right? This is just some, some constant that's allowed to change. And uh, so Sometimes, if they want to be specific, they'll call this the Bessel equation of order c. Right? The c is, of course, coming from this right here. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about uh, is, I, you know, I guess the easiest case is when the order is zero. Now, what's nice when the order is zero is, for instance, 
and a c squared goes away. And now you have a t squared, a t, and a t squared. And as long as you don't allow t to be 0, you can divide by t, and you've simplified things a little bit. Okay, so that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, so Bessel, in studying these equations back in, I don't know, like 1824 or something, he, he actually came up with solutions to these things. And they're uh, very often given in terms of an infinite series. So if we take the Bessel equation of order 0, which is, well, I'll write it with the t's not factored out, but you can factor them. Uh, has a solution called the Bessel function. of order zero. Okay, so he found for each C, right, so each Bessel equation of order C, he found a function called, the, he didn't call it the Bessel function, by the way, uh, but there's a Bessel function of order zero, and, uh, well, there's one of order C for every C, but there's one for zero specifically, and usually for Bessel, uh, you use the letter J, and then you put the order down here, so J sub zero, because it's order zero, and it's j sub t. And I'll give you the, the zeroth one. Uh, now. This. Okay, and I, like I said, it's given in terms of a, an infinite series. Let me use n here. Okay, so it's an alternating series. Right, so each term is going to switch. And the powers of t are always even powers. Right? There are no odd powers of t. Here. It's an even function. And then the coefficients on the bottom are just funky duty. Okay? I mean, we'll, when we go through and figure out where this is coming from, it'll show up. I mean, you'll see how it comes. But when you see it for the first time, it's just like, uh, it's going to be 2 to the 2n power times n factorial squared, obviously. Gotcha. So uh, next week, we will come back, and uh, we're going to, well, since it's given in terms of an infinite series, and we just saw all this nice thing about how the Laplace transform of the series is the series of the Laplace transform, we might as well try to find the Laplace transform of the vessel. And, uh, and then maybe, it, as we go through the course, we'll talk more about this. It's, it's an interesting thing, how you actually get this from that or from that. Okay. So, uh, for those of you I don't see uh, again today, have a nice weekend.